Hey, hey. we're back again. <laughs> uh, Internet's I, uh, not being good to us today. No, it is not. I put in the description, you know, all uh, theology roads lead to Rome. This one I added in even through technology roadblocks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. we're back. Uh, thanks for hanging with us. Um, we picked up, we were finishing up with the, you know, I don't do what I want to do. The thing I don't want to do, I keep on doing. And like our technology wants to work, but it doesn't work. Mm. And stuff like that. Hey, good illustration. Yeah. Thank you, technology, for doing that. Um, yeah, because so. there's some Christians who actually say that, well, I don't sin anymore. I'm such right. a great Christian that I don't sin anymore. That's more. Saying yeah. that is a sin, basically, because you're going against the Bible, and that's kind of prideful. It is. And pride's a sin. Yeah. And it's not recognizing God's word. So you're looking at your life beyond God's word and not recognizing yeah. what it's telling you about yourself. So... Yeah, no one doesn't sin. Only, only a non-believer wouldn't see their sin. Yeah. That at the end of the day, quite honestly, uh, and doesn't therefore see their need for Christ. You know, I'm good enough on my own or something yeah. like that. You know, but this here really highlights and makes that tension. I need Christ, right? What he gives, which I'll pick it up there at the end of chapter seven, right? Thank a wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So it's kind of tension between the new man and the old man, right? As long as this is your chief Lutheran, you know, one of your Lutheran doctrines of the uh, simul justus et peccator, right? Yeah, simultaneous saint and sinner. Um, so yeah, so we got that here going on too. So I'm still 100% of a saint, but yet I have sin working in my life still that Jesus will abolish on the last day. Uh, and then finally, it picks up a chapter 8, right? There's no condemnation. Uh, what do you notice here as you kind of push forward in chapter 8? There's some good, good sections in there. Well, you'll have to talk about it because uh, I'm going to have to skim. I don't You're know fine. my chapters. I love the, um, you know, the, being heirs with Christ as that adoption. We've received the Spirit. You know, it's kind of that down payment. Um, you know, the, the, how do we know that we're going to be included in the last day? Because God's given you a Spirit. And the Spirit mm -hmm. in us cries out to God, Father, save us. Uh, just like a child who needs something from dad, mom, mom, dad. You know, it's kind of, that's the same spirit we've received. Um, the spirit himself bears witness that we're children of God. And then, you know, Paul kind of goes into this future, you know, the sufferings of this present time. And I love that. You know, I, I've used that, uh, you know, when we talk about animals and suffering and the creation groaning. And what, what's kind of something that sticks out to you about all of that? Because I, you know, kind of love that idea here. Um, well, it does kind of get into that... Um do, 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 that creation was cursed because of us. Right. Um, and so creation will also be redeemed through us just as we are redeemed through Christ kind yeah. of idea, um, which kind of flies in the face of what a lot of people think is going to happen on the last day, um, that it's creation's also going to be set free. So creation yeah. isn't bad. I mean, like the end of chapter seven, you know, he's talking about flesh versus spirit and we're thinking, okay, flesh is bad. Um, which it is kind of, you know, fleshes are, you know, it's referring to our sin, you know, our bodies are sinful, but that's, our bodies are also going to be made new, just as all of creation is going to be made new. And, right. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not just this, we're not, we're all going to be disembodied spirits, creation also is going to be restored. Yeah, that out there is waiting for us, right? So the yeah. creation, I love the idea that it's growing, it's going, ugh, you know, so yeah. earthquake happens, oh, it's just, you know, your beloved pet dies, ah, oh, man, it's just, you feel yeah. the pain, you just feel the, the, there's like a longing there, a groaning, there's like that sighing. Uh, you know, what makes us cry out, come Lord Jesus, come. Because uh, when he comes, all this is going to be made yeah. new. It's because of this passage is why I think that we will see our pets again someday. And some people think that our pets die and, you know, our pets, you know, they are obliterated. Yeah, they yeah. don't have, you know, a spirit, so they're not going to be. But it says right here that creation is going to be restored. And right. I would think that would include Oh, yeah. Our pets, too. Our pets are part of creation. Amen. So, so God loves his animals. So he wouldn't have made them if he didn't want them yeah. redeemed. Because um, we're in charge of keeping them. So what are we going to rule over if there's no animals? You know, yeah. Kind of that, why that not sense. the animals we got to know here? That's true, too. So. Uh, which tells us, you know, another purpose of mankind is actually tame, to take care of, to yeah. protect, you know, defend the animals, things like that. Observe them. Like, watch them be animals. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's men all part of it too. Men aren't the enemies of animals. Well, I guess some men are, but right. um, we actually are Sin. meant to 
take care of them. So creation isn't just fine without, you know, some people think that if humans just were wiped out, creation would be fine. Right, do what it really and wants to do. Would be fine, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Which you get back in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that there's no man to work the ground. Like the creation wants to bring crops up and it can't because it's like, ah, oh, there's no mankind to work the field. So the, just as much as we need the creation, the creation needs us too. It can't function. In fact, the creation looks to mankind for guidance and how it's going to be. Yeah. Um, so think about that, you know, kind of the calling that we've perceived as humans. Um, it's well, huge. And that relationship is messed up now. I mean, we screw right. up and we, you know, cause stuff to go and stay, extinct mm-hmm. or um, such like that, but or bring an invasive species. I'm dealing with Japanese beetles You're and my right. roses right now. They're not in their proper place. Yes. Yep. Um, but when, we're meant to take care of it, Amen. which is why I try to get the Japanese beetles off of my roses. There you go, because your job is to take care of your yard. Yep. Yes. Amen. So good. So then all this, you know, he talks about the, uh, the great here connection. Those, the chapter uh, 8, verse 30 here, um, well, chapter 29, uh, verse 29 here, I'll skip a verse head. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right? So this is the God's plan of salvation, his economy. Right? This is how God's managing things. He, he foreknew us. He predestined us. He uh, called us in, the, in time and space. He's justified us through Christ. You know, it's kind of, and then he's glorified. So this idea of God's making us holy and, and through him. And then what's his conclusion there before he jumps into chapter 9 is, you know, what are we going to say about all this? You know, looking at all this, what God has given to us, you know, if, um, if God is for us, who can stand against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him to us. You know, if God has made us righteous because of Christ, God is not going to withhold anything. Right? It's kind of reestablishing that trust that Adam lost because he's sitting mm-hmm. there and a servant's like, you know, God's holding out on you. All right? God really has some good stuff and he doesn't want you to have it. Uh, and here we get this reconfirmation from God. No, this is, I have everything good for you. In fact, here's my own son. Um, so it's kind of this really cool. So God image. did kind of withhold evil from Adam, and Adam went and sought it out. Yeah, yeah he wants it for himself. Yeah. And he takes hold of it. Um, but what's, I, my professor said, I love that they say that our problem is that we always want to take when God wants to give. Mm-hmm. And so when we try to take what, you know, all of a sudden we're like, for, it's violent. It's kind of like a violence that we do. Well, um, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, The Magician's Nephew, the kind of the prequel oh, to yeah. The Chronicles of Narnia. Um, in there, uh, I forget the the main character's name in there, but anyway, he's sent off to this um, this grove, and they, there's fruit trees, and the fruit um, gives life, and all this, you know, it's kind of like the tree of um, uh, the tree of life kind yeah. of idea, and um, he's only supposed to take the one apple to bring back to Aslan, and his mother is sick, and he's thinking, well, maybe if I take another one right. and bring it back to her, she'll live, and he. You know, he ends up overcoming the temptation, comes back, and then Aslan's like, here's an apple to take back to your mother. Right. And he said, if if he had just taken it, you know, without being given it, it would have eventually, you know, it would have healed his mother, but they probably would have come to the point where they would have hated that that had happened right. and wished that had never happened, whereas now it's a gift and it's a good thing. Yeah. So it's the same exact thing, but taken versus given. Yep. So the mankind, we need to learn how to receive instead yeah. of take. But you see it all the time in our culture and our lives. We can't just get receive what God gives. We try to take it. Talk about like children or something like that. We try to take that gift. We try to force it. Um, we try to take our help. Right? We're going to do it because yeah. we want this and we're going to force that conclusion. Um, instead of just letting what God gives be what God gives. Which, which is hard. right? Talk about suffering. But uh, the sufferings of this present time is nothing compared to the glory that is to come. So... Yeah, good. Um, so nothing will separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. That's that great conclusion. And then kind of Paul, kind of, he doesn't change his point, but he kind of starts switching gears on a different point that you can make out of all of this. And he starts talking chapters 9, 10, and 11. And he starts talking about election, you know, predestination. He's talking about, well, holy cow, like the Israelites, they received this and they dropped out. Like, was God's word not efficacious? Did it not work? Um, it, you know, it, did they lose their salvation? Did, you know, did God take it away? You know, you got all these yeah. things that Paul's kind of wrestling with. And kind of, you know, just kind of giving an overview of the argument here. Paul doesn't really reach a conclusion. He kind of like conjectures. He kind of makes some thoughts. 
But at the end of it, he kind of just res- he ends with a doxology, right? A praise God, glory be to God. Um, he doesn't wrap everything up in a nice bow, but he's kind of wrestling with this himself. Um, and so, and those chapters, what's something that kind of sticks out about you? Because I mean, we could spend like hours just on these mm. chapters alone. Well, uh, Lutherans do believe in election. We do. Which people think that's, you know, Calvinist, which is too, but they're usually Calvinist is more focused on God predestined some to, you know, for heaven and some for hell, where we're like, God chooses, you know, you're elected for heaven. And the way you know that is because the church comes along and says, God chose you, yeah. and baptizes you. Yeah. Um, God doesn't send people to hell. We go to hell on our own choice, but God, right. we can't, we can't choose heaven, but we can choose hell. Um, yeah. And so God chooses some for heaven, but he doesn't choose them for hell. Right. Cause even uh, in the, the parable, uh, is it the sheep and the goats or no, the, um, when have you? When have I seen you? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. When you know? When did I see you hungry or not give you something to eat and all that? And he says, um, even in the parable, it's uh, that hell is the place where that was prepared for Satan and his angels, angels. right? Um, not that whereas heaven was prepared for you. you. Yeah. Um, so hell isn't prepared for the unbeliever, but that's where the unbeliever goes. It's the only place they can go, right? Yeah, because that's day. the only that's separate from God, kind of. They chose to separate themselves from God. Right. So you gotta get this incongru like you know, we'll notice that there we're missing a piece of logic here. And in fact, a lot your church fathers, Lutherans, will make note that we're missing a piece of heavenly logic that can only be made sense in heaven. But, you know, uh, in God's sight, he from. exactly <laughs> right. And t- that's another point too. There's a great book, Theology is for Proclamation, that it is the church's job to do the election of God. To look out and say, you were elected. How do you, well, you're like, oh, how, do you, how can you say, how do you know? You're baptized, yeah. right? So we do the job of electing, which is kind of cool. Yeah, because um, I think you get into, I don't understand Calvinism totally, but kind of the idea that you can't know if you're one of the elect, or you yeah. know it through your works or something, you know, it's, yep. it's not. You can a, never be certain. It's not a certain thing. It's Roman Catholics are the same thing. Reformed yeah. and Catholics are the same where, idea. Where like, you were baptized, and, you know, this is what, you know, Christ said he died for you. So right. it's for you. Right. Not you. So you can know for sure. Sir. Right. So you who are baptized, you belong to Christ. Yeah. Uh, that's the good news that, you know, we have that you can take confidence in. Right. This is grounded in history and, and God's very action to me. Uh, so, so he goes through that. He argues, um, you know, the, why does, you know, he'll say things like, well, if God chooses whom he's going to save. Then why does he, you know, find, you know, wrongdoing on our path. You know, if God's one, well, why doesn't he just choose or something like that? And you know, his answer is like, well, why do you talk back to God? Right? Can the potter say to the pottery say to the potter, like, why did you make me this way? So kind of, Paul conjectures and say that it's not our place to talk back to God in that sense. Um, Similar arguments found in Job, which Job will be fun to talk about when we get there. Right, yeah, it will be but. good. Um, yeah, and then of course, you know, he, he starts talking about how it, we have been chosen uh, that in a place that was said, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. So kind of God's choice being made known to us now and calling the Gentiles to faith. You know, I'm a Gentile. Um, you know, Paul, though wrestles, you know, he wishes that he was cut off for the sake of his brothers, that they would be included, even if it meant that he wouldn't be. Um, my heart's desire and prayer, he says at the beginning of chapter 10, is that they would be saved. Um, we find out here in these chapters too that um, who, people who are belong to Israel, so the children of Israel, are not just those who are born of Abraham, but they are the ones who have faith. And so both Israelites and Gentiles, if they have faith in Christ, they are Israel. So you and I are Israel, which is kind of cool to stop and think about that. It's not the people who live in the Middle East that are is Israelites. We are. The church is God's Israel, um, which is a beautiful thing too. And I love the image of chapter 11, right? Paul's there. He uses kind of a garden imagery. Um, and what, is, what sticks out to you about that, the kind of you know, the grafting and and everything like that. You had a good little thought about that before. Yeah, what did video. I say? Well, I talked about cutting off the roots. Right. Um, you should cut off the roots. Um, about the Israelites being shaken off and cut off too. Yeah, well, and that you can be cut off again too. I don't remember what I yeah. said. What did that I say? That was a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, you had mentioned, you know, like, you know, God won't spare. If he didn't spare the natural branches, yeah. neither will he spare you if you, you know, refuse his kindness. Um, so there's no boasting, right? There's no, yeah. like, well, look at me, I've been grafted in, and because you can, you know, be cut off still. So there's kind of this, this humbleness. There's kind of this meekness saying, God has had mercy on me. 
thanks be to God for that. Um, and I won't boast in, in you know my work or in my standing. Um, I will humbly continue in God's righteousness. Um, yeah, I remember you had a good one there, though. Um, if you remember it, jump in. But, um, I don't remember what we were talking about when I said it. So. Yeah, I know. Mm, we should always just videotape yeah, these things. We should write these things down. We should. We should. But yeah, anything as you kind of then finish off those chapters 10, 9, 10, 11 there, just kind of the Paul's, you know, God's election. He does predestine. Like as we say, he doesn't predestine us to hell. He only predestines to heaven. Um, we leave the proper work with whom it belongs. So um, God's the one who saves. We're the ones that, you know, bring about damnation or condemnation. Um, and you know, this is the problem. You have Calvinists who will say, well, God's sovereign. And so he has to, he'll choose who goes to heaven. Well, then he also must choose who goes to hell. So they solve the equation that way. You got their, what they call Arminians. Um, and they will say, well, mankind is the one who's responsible, right? We're, we're the ones that choose. And so we are the ones that choose who goes to heaven and we are the ones who choose who goes to hell. I got to make a choice. Um, Lutherans, we, will, we won't finish off the equation where Paul and the scriptures don't talk. And so we will say along the scriptures that God chooses us to salvation, but mankind chooses where they go to, you know, to hell. Uh, so that's where we leave the proper work at. We don't solve it. We just leave God's responsible for this. I'm responsible for that. And we don't try to make them meet together. Um, that was the logical let conclusion. It be. Yep. So good. Well, then, as we kind of move on to the final chapters, and chapter 12 is one of my favorites. Uh, 1221 is one of my favorite verses. You know, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. um, Paul starts laying out some good, you know, principles as a result of this. Talk about the life that we live as righteous people. What are some of the things that stick out to you in chapters 12 and 13, 14, 15? Um, well, there's some practical stuff like, you know, be subject to the governing authorities, which yeah. people don't always like, but... Um, we're supposed to, you know, God placed authority where it is. And if, if they do something that makes you go against God's word, then you follow you God's word. You don't follow yeah. the governing authorities, but you also accept any punishment. Punish, yeah. Um, you Even don't say, well, that. you shouldn't punish me because, you know, you shouldn't maybe do this in the first place. But if that's the law, then they can punish you. You just also yep. can't go. And we will let the vindication come from God then. Yeah. Right. And that's also, go, that goes back to earlier on with, um, well, why don't we just sin? Why, why can't we just do all the abortions and then, you know, let them all go to heaven and things like that? Um, you know, that condemnation is just. So this because the government does something evil doesn't mean we respond with evil back at yeah. them. Um, we will stand up and say things and, you know, speak up and we won't, com we won't commit to what they're saying. But, but we also accept the consequences of those actions. Right, because we live in a different kingdom. Right? So if someone says you can, we can't meet here, at tr you know, and have church service we would be like okay we're gonna have church service and if you want to come and arrest you and throw you in prison even though i know rebecca doesn't like me saying that okay. <laughs> um, and you will you know we'll accept yeah. that consequence but we will keep meeting right it was a book i read we can't we can't choose the consequences of the gospel mm -hmm. i love that idea right that that god forbid it ever happened right but it might uh and then we can hear jesus words blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's mm -hmm. sake um so there's that as well, so, right? So we, we let our vindication come from God, right? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, um, and we leave it yeah. into his hands. Um, so he talks a bit about uh, we fulfill the law through love. So it's, you know, again, this, the summation of the law is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So love and the law actually go hand in hand. By fulfilling the law, you're loving your neighbor. By loving your neighbor, you're fulfilling yeah. the law. Um, you oh. can't love your neighbor by ignoring the law. Right. Um, so the, the law is fulfilled, right? The, the law is the definition of love. So a lot of people try to back off that, right? The definition of love today is being nice or, you know, letting people never, do whatever they want. Right, yeah. That's, then and you, don't, you can't tell them they can't do whatever they want, right? And even if it's causing harm or yeah. danger, you, have, you know, if you tell them that, well, hands off, right? It's, yeah. How dare you? Um, well, people use that, like, with, like, the marriage, all the marriage debates, um, well, if two people love each other, they should be allowed to get mm. married, or if you love someone, you should, you know, be able to have sex with them, and which, that's not real love, because it's going against the sixth commandment, do right. not commit adultery. Which means that's perversion, right? Yeah. It's, it's actually so it's, hatred. it's not really love. Yeah. Yep. And it's, we're deceived in the thing, that's chapter one all over again, right? We're deceiving the creator for the, cre the creation for the creator, and making our own gods out of it. So you know, we do that with the good things that God, yeah. the creation is, you know, good, but we make, we turn yeah. it and make it bad. Because, yeah, if you, like, really loved your, 
girlfriend, boyfriend, fiance, whatever, you would refrain from having sex until you get married. Right. That's how you show your love. Yeah. And you honor that estate that God's given, which also then allows for the creation of children and, you know, the, yeah. a well-built society. Um, so you're loving your name, you know, because people will say, well, that's my personal choice or something. And that doesn't hurt yeah. anyone else. Like, yes, it does. Yeah. Right? Your personal choices affect everyone else. We forget that. Paul, Paul will note that sin actually hurts the rest of the body. A uh, little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? So um, that's always a good thing. Sin mm-hmm. always hurts. It doesn't matter. It always hurts. So good. There's, of course, oh, yeah, go ahead. So then next we get the do not judge um, right. others, which, you know, um, it's kind of the idea of you should do everything within, you know, in good conscience. So, like, right. it goes back to, like, uh, where he goes else. He goes, I think, a little bit to the, but what to, what you eat. So, I mean, if you can, in good conscience, you know, eat something, you know, that's been sacrificed to idols and doesn't bother your conscience, go ahead. Right. Thank God. Um, if you don't, um, if, if that bothers your conscience, don't eat it. Um, if it helps you to celebrate Christmas, go for it. If you think this is, you're celebrating some pagan holiday, then okay, don't celebrate right. Christmas. Um, but don't pass judgment on someone else for doing it right. when it's not forbidden or commanded. Exactly. You know, these, the, the, oh, at the end of the day, there's this retaining the, the spirit that we've been given, that we share in, um, you know, not grieving someone for whom Christ has died. Um, it, there's even, you know, kind of the, this understanding that goes with, you know, the, the strong and the weak and not passing judgment that what's meant here is that we're not giving final judgment. So I'm looking at it and saying, because you did this, you're going to hell, mm-hmm. right? That's giving a final verdict that only Christ can give. Now I can look at someone and say, okay, this action's hurting people and the Lord says not to hurt people. Why are you doing it, right? So we can look at that. We're not giving a final verdict, but we are saying this is causing hurt, and this is going to hurt you, um, which is actually loving for us to kind of say. Um, and as Christians who have God's law and know his standard, right, we're competent and able to do this. This is why Paul will say, you know, you know, we're going to judge the angels, make a decision on these things, right? You know what the right thing is. So there's that too. Yeah. Anything else that kind of notes there? Chapter 15 has the great, you know, the example of Christ. Uh, Christ didn't come to please himself. Um, all these things that have been written in the Old Testament are written for us. Um, that Christ is the hope for both Jews and Gentiles, that he's coming to make one humanity. You know, we've been, I've been preaching on Ephesians, and Paul's just been going on that left and right. Um, you know, Isaiah, he's pulling up all these Old Testament verses saying, hey, look, at, you can find this out in the Old Testament. This is what God was getting at. Here's what he was looking forward to. And now it's come in Jesus. Um, yeah, so and then when he comes, he'll fill you with hope and peace. Uh, and then Paul, you know, he kinda, as he starts wrapping it up, he's starting to note his, he's a minister of the Gentiles. This is why he does what he does. He hasn't come to them yet because he's been trying to not build on someone else's foundation. He's been trying to find other places that don't know about Christ. But now he's starting to run out of room, and so he wants to go to Spain. So, hey, he wants to stop in Rome first because he's always kind of wanted to stop there. It's kind of the, the heart of the empire, right? This is, the, this is where the emperor lives, you know, I'm, Paul has been told that he's going to have to go before the emperor to confess and things like that. When he was converted, this is what Jesus said, he's going to bring my name before kings and Gentiles. Um, yeah. yeah. Then we conclude with a bunch of personal greetings, which I always like reading all these names. If you start comparing them from book to book, you start See seeing some names. similar. I mean, obviously you got Priscilla and Aquila. They were an axe. Right. Um, there's another Mary. We don't know which Mary that might have been. I mean, there's probably some theories out there, but yeah. there's like, what did you say, seven maids, Marys six, seven, or eight, something yeah. like that? Yeah, my, my note there says Mary, one of the six Marys in the New mm-hmm. Testament, probably yeah. unknown. So it could be a Mary we know, it could be a Mary we don't know. Yeah. So basically he lists a long bunch of people, as we said at the beginning, that this is kind of his letter of reference, sort of, that, hey, these yeah. people all know me, greet them, say hi to them. Yep. Um, it's kind of, he's in this circle and, and things like that, yeah. too. Yeah. And then he kind of lists some of the people who are with him who greet them. Right. Timothy is one of them. Tim- yeah, Timothy pops up in, I think, over half of Paul's letters yeah. as the, an author along with Paul. So it's not just Paul's letters, but it's almost half of these are Timothy's letters, yeah. too, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, so a bunch of people that are also greeting them. So, it's you know, these are also, pers- you know, almost personal letters between yeah. the churches, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. These, these are, this is not just separate little churches that don't, these are churches that are well connected. We, you know, sometimes think that the churches were scattered and they had no idea who, these kind of tell us, no, they, they know each know, other pretty well. Yeah. Um, they know their circles really well. 
There's a final there, the appeal to watch out for those who cause divisions, heresies there, create obstacles contrary to the doctrine, the teachings that we've been taught. Avoid those kind of people. Uh, they don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They feed their own appetites and they're smooth talkers and they like to deceive the naive. You know? So there's kind of this, Paul's also writing to watch out for these people. You get that from Jesus. All of Paul's letters kind of get at that um, because that doesn't build up. It tears down and the God of, you know, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet because uh, they live in the middle of the Roman Empire, right? They live right at the heart. Of the, if the emperor is going to make a decision, it's going to affect those Christians there first. Yeah. Um, and so he's kind of you know, giving them encouragement. And then there's also Tertius there who also wrote this letter. So Paul did that with his own hand, write this letter, right? He dictated it. So there's this scribe and he's like listening and he's writing down everything that Paul's saying. That might be why um, some of Paul is hard to read. That could be true. Because it's, he's, it's more often because he's, I think you said in Ephesians, there's like this super, super long sentence. Yeah. And it's just because he's not, you write different than you speak. And so if someone's dictating what he's speaking, it's going to sound a little different right. than if he had just written it. And you're, and these are called amanuensis here. They're uh, people who write on behalf of others and they would be professional. So it wouldn't be like someone who does like, what? how do you spell that word? These are people who know their language and their grammar. So even if Paul says something, he's thinking, mm, that's bet it's better grammar because we put it this way. Uh, he would tell Paul that too. He's like, hey, this, this is how that sounds. Um, so these are, these are capable, able people as well. And then finally, there's the doxology. And let's just read it because it kind of summarizes everything in Romans so well. Um, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, interesting word, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's how Paul finishes his letter, right? Glory be to God. So good. There you go. Romans. Okay. Any thoughts or conclusions that I, we maybe have missed or something that just hit you? I think we covered a good chunk of it. We did. And once again, it's one of those videos we, go, we went over time. But at yeah. the same time, there's just so much good stuff. Well, now that, it's two videos, so they can watch hey, some There you go. Part one and part two. Um, got a couple of videos for you. Good. Well, let's say a prayer then. We'll give a final blessing and we'll call this episode wrapped up. Yeah. Let's pray. To our God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to your Son, Jesus Christ, that you have made known to us the mystery that was hidden before the ages, that we are in you, that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have brought us into your family and to the faith that you've given us righteousness and standing before you. Lord, continue us in this kindness and in this faith and help us to hope in you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.